So hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the launch of Swan Vancouver's Anti-Trafficking Harming While Trying to Help project. My name is Alison Clancy, Swan Executive Director. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. So for 20 years, SWAN has supported the rights, health and safety of newcomer migrant and immigrant women engaged in indoor sex work through frontline services and systemic um, advocacy. And over the years, SWAN has supported women who were trafficked. However, a significant amount of SWAN's time is spent supporting women who are anti-trafficked. That is, uh, women who are not trafficked and who experience the negative consequences of anti-trafficking campaigns, laws, policy, and enforcement. So much of our work is taken up managing, resisting, and responding to the collateral damage caused by mainstream anti-trafficking campaigns. So what we've realized in our work is that there are many well-intentioned people who hear about human trafficking, are, are drawn to the cause, and feel compelled to do something about it. However, there's a lack of awareness of how these campaigns sometimes do more harm than good. And this project uh, attempts to raise awareness of the harms of uh, anti-trafficking and uh, to offer alternatives uh, that are ethical and informed by the people who are most an, uh, impacted by the campaigns. Uh, to help us achieve our goal, we have convened a very distinguished panel uh, today who are extremely knowledgeable on the issue. But before I introduce the panel, uh, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar uh, in which the audience can see and hear the panelists, but we cannot see you and you cannot see each other. Uh, please send questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to as many of those today as we can. Uh, if you are experiencing any technical issues, please uh, inform our tech support person, Helena Saferling, uh, in the Q&A uh, function, and uh, she'll try her best to uh, address as many of those as she can. The webinar will be recorded and will be posted on our website and social media in the coming days for you to share to others, as well as the video we will show. And the resources that we mentioned throughout uh, today's uh, webinar will be posted in the chat box at the end of the dialogue. So now I will introduce um, the panelists who have very generously contributed their time to be with us today. Kamala Kempadu is a professor of social science at York University in Canada and is currently a COGUT visiting professor at Brown University USA. She speaks internationally and has published extensively on the Caribbean sex trade and global anti-trafficking discourses. Her publications include Trafficking and Prostitution Reconsidered, New Perspectives on Migration, Sex Work, and Human Rights, edited with the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women's Jyoti Sangara and Bandana Pataniak, and also Global Sex Workers, Rights, Resistance, and Redefinition, edited with Joe Dezima. She is currently working on a new edited collection on racism, coloniality, and anti-trafficking with Alina Shi. Annalie Lepp is an associate professor in the Department of Gender Studies at the University of Victoria in Canada. She is a founding member of the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, GATW Canada, which was established in 1996, and she is currently vice president of GATW's International Board of Directors. Recently, she was a contributing author to the GATW's publication, Sex Workers Organizing for Change, Self-Representation, Community Mobilization and Working Conditions in 2018, and co-editor of a special issue of the journal Anti-Trafficking Review on Sex Work in 2019. Tamara O'Doherty is a lecturer in the School of Criminology at Simon Fraser University in Canada, where she teaches courses in law and criminal cr criminology. Her research interests include socio-legal inquiry, human rights, government, sorry, governance and ethics in knowledge production with a particular focus on the criminalization of commercial, 
commercial sex, and human trafficking. Tamara is representing research conducted with Dr. Haley Miller, who is a critical scholar with a strong international law background who teaches in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of the Fraser Valley in Canada. And I know Haley is tuning in today, so hello Haley. And finally, Joel Quirk is a professor of politics at the University of the Witwatersrand, South Africa. His research focuses upon slavery and abolition, human mobility, social movements, and the politics of history, uh, sorry, in the politics and history of Africa. He recently co-edited a special issue of the Anti-Trafficking Review on Everyday Abuse in the Global Economy. So welcome to all of our panelists. And also a welcome and thanks in advance to our tech support who will be busy working behind the scene, Helena Saferly. So to kick off the project launch today, we will begin by showing one of the four components of the project. Uh, it's an illustrated video titled Anti-Trafficking, Harming While Trying to Help, followed by the panel discussion. Along with the video, the second component is a companion guide that provides more detail than uh, a six minute video uh, can on such complex issues. And this will be posted at the end of the webinar. The third component of the project is the launch of a Harms of Anti-Trafficking Action Group. This group will convene locally in Greater Vancouver to bring forward ineffective or harmful anti-trafficking campaigns and strategize ways to approach the individuals or groups for the purpose of making the campaign more effective and less harmful. After all, doesn't everyone uh, in this area want to rest easy knowing that their efforts have maximum impact without hurting anyone along the way. So while this project uh, will be a local group, we are hoping others tuning in today will be inspired to convene groups in your local areas. And then finally, the fourth component of the project is an interactive web page where people can share transformative actions and mind shifts. Uh, perhaps you were doing anti-trafficking work that you realized was harming rather than helping. And this is an opportunity to share with others what you are doing differently once you came to this understanding. So now without further ado, I present to you uh, the video anti-trafficking harming while trying to help. Just a moment. So many people hear the words human trafficking. And are compelled to do something about it. What if I told you that the help you're giving actually harms me? Uh -huh. You know, people do have good intentions, but what you probably don't know is that these efforts are often ineffective or counterproductive. People are being trained to look for signs of trafficking, but a lot of times it makes them see trafficking where it isn't. This creates a moral panic in society. I was pulled off a flight. Oh, yeah. That was me. I was with Mike, my boyfriend. You know, I didn't need to be rescued. Oh. 
So you're saying that all this trafficking training isn't helpful. How about all these awareness campaigns? Do you mean they're oversimplified or? Don't get me wrong. There are real issues surrounding human trafficking. But these campaigns miss the mark, Debbie. They don't help anyone. They just lead to more campaigns. Really? Did you know that these rescue missions resulting from these campaigns are often based on urban myths? In reality, the rescue missions are actually just raids on the sex industry. They lead to more surveillance and enforcement for people who don't even need to be rescued. There is rarely even a victim. It actually makes working conditions a lot more dangerous for people like me, who are just trying to get by. So Lin, are you saying that human trafficking rescue missions are just a way to crack down on the sex industry? Unfortunately, Debbie, an ill-conceived rescue does not result in a trafficking conviction, but it does waste time, resources, and a lot of taxpayers' dollars. <laughs> And without a victim, it's just the sex workers who are charged. What? But the government and police spend so much money on these raids and rescues. I donate a lot to this cause. I started the NGO to help this situation. This is no accident. Human trafficking campaigns are a red herring. But they are almost always driven by a hidden moral, political, and economic agenda. A single focus on sex trafficking means that most other forms of trafficking are being overlooked, Debbie. This is fundamentally harmful. It deflects from laws and corporate policies that exploit workers in all kinds of industries. Oh no. You mean I'm part of this problem? I wanted to be part of the solution. Debbie, you can be. Look, most anti-trafficking campaigns use horrific sensational imagery to evoke a strong emotional reaction aimed at your wallet. But if you really want to help, you have to exercise due diligence. You want your actions to be informed, ethical, and responsible. You want to validate sources. Also, think about any hidden moral, political, or economic agendas there may be behind any campaign. Make sure your good intentions and your money are helping to support workers and migrants' rights. You really can fight child and youth exploitation without violating the rights of sex workers. You can talk with sex workers to find out if a campaign is helpful or harmful. Talk with other types of workers too. Just whomever you're trying to help, make sure to include them at every step. This is how we sort fact from fiction. Everyone must exercise due diligence to know that they're actually helping the people they intend to help. So when it comes to the fight against human trafficking, what can you do to make sure you're helping? Not harming. So oh, before we can begin the um, panel dialogue, I just would like to just really send out a heartfelt thanks to all of those who worked uh, on the video. So uh, most notably, Roseanne Lambert of Flippin' Pictures, Janet McLeish, uh, Kelly Goh, Andrea Wiseman, video advisors, uh, Joel Furk and Anna Lee Lapp, and of course the funder Lush Cosmetics. <laughs>
So to begin the panel discussion, I think it's important to start off with uh, the defin of definition of human trafficking. Um, these days, human trafficking covers uh, so many issues. So to the panelists, what is human trafficking? How do you define human trafficking? I can start. I think that oftentimes what we do is we go to the UN trafficking protocol definition. Certainly the definition was the subject of enormous debate when it was being developed and uh, the definition itself is quite complex, but I think that what it really does is it looks at the three elements of what is considered trafficking. The first is, and it's a very specific uh, process the, and, and very different from smuggling, for example, and smuggling and trafficking are often conflated as well. But first of all, it's a set of actions which involve recruiting or moving someone. There's also a means, uh, a, uh, usually a coercive means of some sort, such as threat, use of force, abduction, fraud, deception, abuse of power. And then the third element is that there's a purpose. And the purpose is uh, to place an individual in uh, particular forms of exploitation for which they're being recruited and moved. And I think that oftentimes the, the trafficking is, there are many definitions of trafficking out there and even Stats Canada did a study in 2010 and what they found was that in the, uh, even in the policy making and NGO communities, there's, there were very, very different ideas and understandings of trafficking. And I think that's one of the issues that we're here to discuss. Um, oh, go ahead, Tamara. Oh, is this, okay. Um, no, I was just going to uh, take note of the fact that when we're talking about this definition, we talk about it in the context of public um, stuff and like NGOs and nonprofits, but the reality from the policing and the prosecution perspective looks very different again. Um, so here we know from some of the research that Dr. Miller and I have done and others um, internationally, that the way that the police and the government are collecting data is misrepresentative of what we're talking about in terms of human trafficking as well. So if we were actually using a definition like what Annalie presented as the international definition, we would not have the numbers that we are currently seeing as reported by the Canadian government. And when you actually dig into those numbers, you'll see even, I mean, I remember with one of our key findings from 2015 was the fact that one of the largest categories of statistics was something called human trafficking related. This was where the bulk of the charges and the convictions were coming from, this, this general category of human trafficking related. And that was what was being presented internationally as Canada's numbers. We also know that we were even claiming that we had human trafficking convictions in Canada prior to the criminal code offenses even being enacted which is a very curious process by which you should ever be labeling something um, because these are simply not real convictions of anything relating to actual human trafficking. This is the related category, which just shows us how broadly we've been trying to um, uh, cast the net in this particular domain. Mm Can I add in something here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can hear. Um, yeah. So apart from the, having the UN definition, which I think is a sort of a very broad and sometimes a helpful definition, um, from where I work and where I'm sitting um, in the Caribbean, um, the definition that's perhaps the most widely known is more attached to the US uh, State Department and the US TIP report because that is used internationally to um, evaluate countries as to how they're doing and, at, and attached to that report uh, that evaluation every year is a threat of economic sanctions that, from the US State Department. So many countries around the world outside of the global north are actually responding to the US ideas about um, trafficking, which are narrower that I don't have the exact definition in front of me, but a narrower than the UN 
um, ideas of trafficking and tend to push us to think, to conflate trafficking with um, sex work. And um, so, you know, the way in which it's taken up then is that migration across the border for sex, for sex work is automatically seen by people on the ground as trafficking. Um, so that's a real problem in terms of the definitions and how um, people um, on the ground are thinking about it and taking it up. So apart from the sort of broad UN and US definitions, um, it's mobilized quite differently on the ground. And it has some you know, harmful repercussions as we see in that film. Um, and I think I would like to add in here one of the um, um, things that I've noticed recently is that uh, the way that the definition of trafficking is stretched sometimes, again through the US, is, um, can be seen in a statement that uh, the Florida Senator Rick Scott put out recently on his website. And I'm just going to quote it because he's talking about the Cuban assistance, medical assistance around the world, but particularly also in the Caribbean region um, for the COVID pandemic. And he says, and I quote, this is the latest example of Cuba actively engaging in human trafficking with their sham medical program. This is not about helping anyone. Cuba uses this program as a way to funnel money to their regime and rarely pays a living wage to the physicians they force to work in other countries. Cuba is using the coronavirus pandemic for profit at the expense of these hardworking physicians. We cannot allow it. Any country that requests medical assistance from Cuba is aiding their human trafficking efforts. The international community must stand against the use of forced labor and Cuban's regime, Cuban regime's exploitation of this crisis, end of quote. So what it's telling us is, you know, they're thinking that medical doctors are being sent around the world by the Cuban government and being forced to work, but accusing the government of, of human trafficking of their people, right? Um, it's, it's a very dangerous and very slippery slope when we, when we um, go down there and, and, and thinking about human trafficking. So that's one of the sort of extreme ways in which human trafficking is defined and understood and taken up and mobilized. Thank you for that. And thank you all for providing uh, some clarity around the definition and, and this uh, dialogue will self certainly delve deeper into the agendas uh, behind governments and NGOs and others and how um, trafficking um, is being used. Um, so this concept that we've approached in this project, harming while trying to help in the context of anti-trafficking may be a new concept uh, for many. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to how mainstream anti-trafficking campaigns are harmful. Joel. Um, so firstly, thank you for the, the opportunity to, to, to speak here. I think it's an absolutely fantastic project. <laughs> I think there's a bit of a kind of intake of breath when asked what's the problem because there's not one problem there's many 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 problems and if we were to kind of grapple with all of them we'd be speaking for far longer than than we have available in time so so I guess what I'd say is I think there's two boxes that are worth emphasizing I think the first is a lot of anti-trafficking campaigns are ineffective by design. So there's, there's a cluster of campaigns around raising awareness campaigns, spot the signs campaigns, corporate social responsibility campaigns, where you're supposed to report on uh, forced labor in your supply chain. Um, and, and, you know, zombie facts and figures where sensational kind of accounts of scope and scale and accelerating global transnational crime. A lot of these kind of things are not necessarily directly harmful, but they use up a lot of political oxygen and space that might otherwise be directed towards dealing with kind of systems of 
labor exploitation and, and systems associated with the, the, the regimes that kind of govern migration and how people cross borders. So anti-trafficking is popular partly because of its kind of sensationalism, but also because it has this capacity to displace more critical political reflection about how our deeply unjust, racialized, hierarchicalized, gender patriarchal driven global order is organized. So, so there's an element of deflection that goes on. Anti-trafficking takes up political space that was previously occupied by anti-sweatshop movements where the, the problem was not forced labor in supply chains, the problem was all forms of exploitative labor in supply chains. And the first version of that challenge, all forms of labor run by multinational corporations is inherently a problem and must be addressed, is far more politically challenging than a model of anti-trafficking that says, well, all of this labor's fine except for this kind of residual aberrant cases at the very bottom of the supply chain that good corporations can be relied upon to kind of address voluntarily. So, so there's elements of displacement going on. Anti-trafficking is popular politically because it doesn't challenge dominant political and economic interests within the, the global arrangement of, of capital and movement and labor. But there's also, as the video suggests, a sharper end to anti-trafficking. And this is the idea that, that's kind of most prominently associated with kind of GAT W's in the landmark report on collateral damages, where specific interventions associated with anti-trafficking become a shield for anti-immigration regimes. I mean, it's no surprise that Donald Trump's ridiculous wall is being justified as an anti-trafficking device, even though it's stupid on every conceivable level. But also, more particularly, anti-trafficking becomes the shield for efforts to intervene in sex work. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I know everything about sex work. I, I think sex workers are much better uh, positioned to speak to that than I am. But I do know that these interventions are characterized by an absence of conversations with sex workers. And as a consequence, end up engaging directly in, in harmful measures that adversely affect all kinds of things. So, so I think that's it. Part of it just doesn't work. And then more specifically at the sharper end, there's things that are actively harmful when put into practice. Yes, Kamala. So one of the things um, Joel just raised, but is also clear um, in the video, and I'm not sure how intentional this was, is the question of how these mainstream anti-trafficking um, campaigns are also part and parcel of white saviorism um, that is emanated coming out from the global north um, and you know taken up by celebrities as well um, and bolstering a sense of of, of you know do-goodism amongst uh, people and i think it's something that we need to pay much more attention to um, and I, the video was curious because Debbie is, is clearly a white woman there and the police are all white and, you know, all the, the traffic persons in this video, well, the people speaking back, were of color. Um, and I'm not sure how, if that was an intentional comment on race and racism um, that permeates the uh, um, anti-trafficking movement, the mainstream anti-trafficking movement. But it certainly um, does that and speaks to that. And I think that is an element that we're not paying enough attention to either, but which is deeply embedded in, um, you know, in bolstering white saviorism around the world through a various of campaigns and work that's taking place. Thank you. Yes, Annalee. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on that point. I think with regard to the sex industry, I think that it goes much further than simply intervening in the sex industry. I think 
in Canada, at least, if we look at the legislation, that it was really the, the sex worker legislation in conversation with the anti-trafficking le legislation was really meant to eradicate the sex industry and was seen as a mechanism to do so. I think the other thing that I wanted to mention is when we did the study sex workers organizing for change, which is a seven country study that was done by GATW, it was very clear that from the perspective of sex worker organizations, that trafficking was something that came from outside, was kind of imposed on already existing organizations who have done so much work for decades in looking at working conditions in the sex industry through very peer-based uh, models. And then suddenly the anti-trafficking framework sort of arrived and many times uh, sex worker organizations who are doing on the ground grassroots work are spending, a cons and I think Allison, you mentioned this, are spending so much time and energy responding to anti-trafficking campaigns and discourses. And what that does, I think one of the more harmful effects of that is that it prevents them from doing the actual work that they organized to do, which was to provide services and support and to address working conditions in the industry. And unfortunately, what we've seen, at least in Canada, is that sex worker organizations are never brought to the table in the development of campaigns and policies and legislation and in some respects are actively marginalized from those conversations. And I've seen examples of that happening in the Canadian context and uh, certainly is happening in the US context as well. Just before we let this one go, because I can't not, um, uh, just and to pick up on some of the things that um, Joel was saying about that blunt end, I, I mean, thank you for introducing it so broadly. Those are very much the drivers here, in my opinion, as well. Um, but also what Kamala was bringing, you know, in terms of maintaining a focus on the effects these campaigns are having. Um, they're, they're very real effects that they're having on individuals, but also on systems and on the maintenance of stereotypes. I mean, they've literally led to the over surveillance of certain racialized groups throughout um, certainly Canada, but I would imagine this is true everywhere. Um, they've also allowed us to under protect those same racialized groups. So when we look at the cases and how they're being prosecuted in court, when people don't fit into this idealized victim that we've created, who is not a real person, who is white and who experienced some incredible form of violence and who is being, her innocence is a her and it's a system gender her innocence is being violated by some you know evil fear uh, this, this just doesn't match people's realities to the to the greatest degree and so when they're in trials and you have the real person sitting in front of you it's hard for judges and jury members to match those two so we're actually seeing a lot of cases where there probably was some form of violence or exploitation that occurred however we're not able to actually convict that because we've created this ridiculous idea of what a victim looks like that is never going to function to actually address victimization of violence. This also has been completely impacting any form of labor exploitation that can make it through into the criminal trials or even in any other domain because we have this view of human trafficking as solely this one narrative and it just misrepresents the very big realities of people in labor exploitation situations everywhere else in every other labor domain. Yeah, so thank you everyone for, for highlighting all uh, some of the ways um, in which campaigns can be harmful or ineffective. So my next question to you is, why do these campaigns persist? Joel, would you like to start off uh, with this one? Uh yeah again that they're very good questions but one of the reasons they're good is that they're big um I, I i had to have a go at it i'd maybe raise a couple of points without in any way suggesting that that this is an exhaustive list i'm i'm sure my colleagues will kind of kind of add to it i think Part of it is that anti-trafficking is a way of redefining and advancing a particular orientation towards sex work. And 
it's very effective in this incarnation and consequently it persists because it's tactically and politically useful in advancing a model which is in some ways a rearguard defensive action against the decriminalization of sex work um, and to embrace the, the, the so-called Nordic model. But I think that's the familiar reason. I, I think there's perhaps a more interesting reason around questions of, of tactics and strategy. I think that over the last 20 years, there's been a, a gravitational pull associated with anti-trafficking where organizations who work on all kinds of issues, domestic work, child labor, migration, uh, conflict, supply chains, and so on, have kind of calculated that if they start speaking and acting in terms of anti-trafficking or so-called modern slavery, they will generate additional attention. They'll secure access to funding streams. And as a consequence, a lot of organizations have found it advantageous to rebrand themselves as being within this tent because the calculation is that tactically and strategically this tent brings access. So if you work on, on, on migrant rights, you're used to having a very hostile kind of interaction with government. If you work on anti-trafficking, you'll get invited to cabinet meetings, you'll be on the inside, and as a consequence, people have decided that this is advantageous. And, and what it means is it generates a widespread reluctance to, to be too critical regarding the hand that feeds. Because by raising problems and, and grappling with questions of collateral damage, and then more generally whether, whether any of this works at all, you risk compromising that access. And, and as a consequence, there's, there's a deep-seated reluctance to be too critical. So, so in my mind, I, I think it's a difference between being on the inside and, and thinking that you have the capacity to shape policy through the access that being on the inside gives or being on the outside and, and mobilizing around questions of kind of migrant and worker rights, where we all know that migrant and worker rights aren't doing too well these days. So it's some level at a short term kind of level, there's a tactical basis for picking up the baton. But I think this comes at significant cost. Firstly, you end up being complicit in all of the collateral damages that are directed towards sex workers and migrants. And secondly, I think the problem is that governments do what they're going to do. And, and, and as a consequence, I'm less convinced that being on the inside actually gives you the capacity to nudge policy in effective directions. So, so as a consequence, um, I, I think that this trade-off buys silence and creates a reluctance to speak out, but it's an open question whether the, the presumed advantages follow in the way people think they do. Thank you for that. Yes, Kamala. Thank you, Joel. Yes, I, I, I fully agree, I think. And I think also what um, people are drawn to anti-trafficking, um, it seems to suggest a quick and easy fix, right, of a problem that is huge. We're dealing with global capitalism that is really, you know, creating enormous disparities in wealth between, you know, the rich and the poor. And this is just growing and growing. And this is creating these kind of issues and problems of, you know, people having to, needing to migrate for work, the labor, accepting jobs that are way below you know any standard um, and um, pay and so forth um, so that larger neoliberal capital if you like um, um, a global capitalism is has disempowered us a lot as well in thinking about how do we change this and I think anti-trafficking really just you know is a is a very quick and, quick and easy fix particularly because it's connected to this idea about women being exploited, you know, in the sex trade, and um, 
And so it's got that sensational aspect to it. So it's very easy for people to gravitate and feel good about if they get in, engaged. Um, and so they, people, you know, so we kind of turn a, away from the structural issues that need to be tackled. Um, and a patriarchy, racism, and capitalism, if you like, the big three, are hard to take on. And we know that globally, we don't have many shiny examples that we can turn to as alternative kind of structures or you know, visions um, to work with. And so I think, you know, I think that's a really important part of the picture as well. It, uh, it does kind of offer this, you know, E easy thing to, to grab hold of and to grab onto and think that you know we'll be doing some good somehow if we get on the anti-trafficking bandwagon. Thank you, Tamara. Yes. Yeah, and, and just to echo some of that, but also to remind it's it's the it's a money maker, right? It's a this is an economically driven activity for a lot of organizations and groups, including the police. Right? I mean, you actually have police departments who receive more funding if they can show that they have received, you know, they've, they've done enough investigations, they'll get extra staffing because now they need the people to keep that up. And this is a demand from the community to do something about human trafficking. We certainly saw that in the lead up to the Olympics when we hosted here in Vancouver. Um, the, the demand from the community for the police to do something about human trafficking was what actually instigated uh, the raid and rescue that happened in 2004 and 2006 um, here in Vancouver. Um, but I think that we should also not, not never forget the usefulness, right? The functionality of these kind of campaigns. They allow us to moralize about sex, sexuality, where it belongs, what consent looks like. We allow us to moralize, you know, and to actually continue surveillance over very specific groups of society who have for very like hundreds of years been deemed as you know the ones who are more threatening more fearful don't abide by the um, neo-colonial western kind of idea of what we ought to abide by and where our relationships ought to be um, and I think that one of the other reasons that these these campaigns persist is because of who well not only are they easy right I mean in terms of, of low-hanging fruit right it's this is this is an easier thing to go after than as was mentioned by my colleagues here the larger issues those are too hard those are big and we are super happy to give a hundred bucks to an organization but would we support livable wages you know a sustained kind of economic model where we were actually dealing with some of the root causes for why people have to take employment options that um, are as brutal as they are in some situations um, but the other part of it is who's resisting Right? The folks who are resisting are not the people who are typically in power positions in our societies. So, you know, as Kamala mentioned, who is resisting this is really important too. We silence those individuals because we can't. Right? They don't have the same political capacity as the rest of us do in, a, in any society. And so particularly with migrants, where we can literally just make them leave. Um, we, we, we don't have to necessarily pay attention to their needs. So I think that those functional elements and the realities are really important for us to talk about too. Thank you. Yes, Annalie. I, I guess one of the other things that I wanted to mention under neoliberal capitalism that the NGO community is fighting for every dollar insofar as the whole funding model for NGOs has changed. So even in GATW in Bangkok, it, they used to get core funding to have staff and now it's all project-based funding. And we see that in NGOs in Victoria and across Canada, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, but so there is this competition for funding. And in many respects, the big funding is ar on, around anti-trafficking as opposed to migrant rights, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that with in 2010, GATW really had a significant conversation around whether they wanted to leave the anti-trafficking business because of the, the, the findings of the collateral damage report. And I think that strategically what we decided and we revisit this over and over is that we will still engage hopefully to make some impact in the direction of policy, 
but at the same time be a critical voice and probably one of the only international critical voices against um, some of the ways in which anti-trafficking measures have been implemented around the world. So I think that the effects of neoliberal capitalism is also the way in which the nonprofit communities are fighting for every dollar. And yes, there is this process of rebranding insofar as that's where the money is now being invested. And the amount of money invested in anti-trafficking is astronomical. If you, I think if we would do an overall sort of budget spreadsheet, I think that we would find that the amount of money invested is really, really significant. Yeah, so just uh, just to build, I think, a little bit on this um, discussion, uh, I just wanted to ask, why does trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation or popularly known as sex trafficking uh, garner so much attention in comparison to labor trafficking? No small questions here today. Anyone like to start on that one? Yes, Annalie. I, I just, I mean, this is very simplistic, but I'll just start it off. But I think that under the, the systems of global capitalism, there are certain forms of exploitation that are simply accepted. There's sort of the mundane exploitation of agricultural workers in Canada, migrant agricultural workers in Canada. And somehow the, uh, the fact that sex work is not considered work then different criteria applies to the sex industry than with other sectors of the economy that are incredibly exploitative. In sex workers organizing for change, we found in certain countries that in India, for example, that sex workers found that they would rather than do sex work because it was more lucrative as opposed to going into other sectors of, uh, of the economy that were, they considered more exploitative in terms of poor wages and so forth, and even working conditions. So I think that the sex industry has always been separated out as not labor. And so there is an acceptance of, on the one hand, there's the acceptance of certain forms of labor or exploitation as simply an effect of global capitalism and others that are not ex acceptable and, um, and different criteria is applied. Very simplistic answer, but just wanted to throw that out there. Pamela. So just to also um, reiterate a little of what I said at, at the start, is that because um, a big part of the world is actually policed through the US definition of traf human trafficking, which focuses so heavily on um, sex work as not as sexual exploitation, right? Um, so a lot of the world has been actually corralled into thinking that human trafficking means sex work, right? Um, and and I think that's a, a real problem. I mean, I see it here continuously in this region as to how governments a push to respond to the US State Department based on their ideas about what trafficking is. And the first thing that happens is a raid on the sex industry. And, um, and it's there that they you know, uh, can pick up pe people because um, prostitution is outlawed in much of the region. And so you immediately find people who are working underground, you know, um, undocumented migrants and um, of people who are working outside of any formal structures. Um, so you, you, so the governments, you know, can kind of produce very quickly some information and very easily, if you like, some information about um, trafficking through using the sex industry as this um, as a locus. And um, you know, the, the U.S. government demands um, information about the number of convictions of human trafficking in order to be counted in you know uh, and to show to to deliver evidence of what you're doing as a government and so again the sex industry is the place that is so easily targeted because it's not seen as work it's not it's criminalized in so many um countries that um 
that it's it's uh, it's just a sort of sitting duck there, if you like. Yeah. Annalie, yes. And we'll I just up. wanted to add. I mean, I think that the reason, one of the key reasons, is is because of the conflation of sex work and trafficking, mm -hmm. which is such an integral part of the discourse. And so applying that, um, for example, agricultural work is not conflated with trafficking. Domestic work is not <clears throat> conflated with trafficking. And all of the other, you know, hyper exploited worker sec sectors are not conflated with trafficking. And I think it's that very conflation that allows the sex industry to be the main target of anti-trafficking campaigns and discourses. And Joel, you wanted to make a point. Um, two quick points. One is, I, I think there's a potential objection to the question that goes, this was true previously, but is less true now. And, and I think, I, I don't accept this objection, but I, I think it's worth raising because I think there'll be people in the audience who'll be thinking this. And, and the reason I don't think it's a useful objection is I think it's worthwhile distinguishing between the rhetoric associated with anti-trafficking and where the substantive energy and action is in terms of where interventions are made by government. So if you go and have a look at a UNODC report or a TIP report or any number of other kind of government and international organization publications, you'll find a formal list of different forms of trafficking that will cover all kinds of things. It'll be forced labor in Uzbekistan, shrimp boats in East Asia, gulags in North Korea, coltan smuggling in, in, in kind of DRC, domestic work in like Peru, um, and so on and so forth. So in formal terms, people can object and say anti-trafficking is more than questions associated with sex. But when you really get down to, to where the energy and action is, it, it quickly becomes apparent that, that a lot of these other elements uh, don't have the same kind of political traction. They don't have the same level of, of popular investment. And, and they pose complicated, awkward questions for kind of governments and corporations. And consequently, they're much easier to talk about than do anything about. And, and consequently, this kind of feeds back into this practical investment on issues of sex trafficking. And, and I also think, and this is a slightly odd point to make, it's, it's sometimes not about sex trafficking so much as sex trafficking as a site for other anxieties. And here it's become evident that a huge amount of, of energy associated with, with the, the issue of sex trafficking now is coming from QAnon and QAnon adjacent activity on the internet. And, and <laughs> With all due respect, actually, there's not a lot of respect for QAnon, but in, in reference to QAnon, I don't think it's true that QAnon started with a concern with sex trafficking and then worked backwards to this insane conspiracy theory regarding celebrities in the deep state. I think they started with an insane conspiracy theory regarding celebrities in the deep state and then came to sex trafficking because there's things associated with this issue which mean that it resonates with this broader agenda and viewpoint of the world. And, and I think that's partly what goes on. Sex trafficking appeals to ideas of anxiety and stranger danger and fear and ideas of conspiracy and criminality. So its profile as an issue generates interest in investment in a way that the kind of everyday and mundane issues associated with migration and labor are just not interesting or attractive or salient. So sometimes it's actually not about sex trafficking, it's about fears on other issues being channeled into sex trafficking as an issue because it's a comfortable vessel for those types of things. Yes, Tamara. 
you knew I wasn't gonna let this one go either. No. Um, just to, to, to pick up on what Joel is saying, there's a long history, right, of a lot of countries. I mean, we used to literally call it white, uh, like the white slavery movement, right? Like there's a long history of us using trafficking related or slavery related concerns um, as actually a way to sustain gender specific and racialized, very clear, uh, categorization between people and trying to sustain those those categories and the use and the rejection of all those individuals so that that's 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 a historical fact that we're simply continuing on today by calling it modern slavery um, but I wanted to really make sure that people understand when we're talking about these large political issues, you know, how that works out on an individualized level as well. I mean, we talk about politicization of law, and I think it's really important for people to understand what that means in that how, how we motivate politics to happen is based on what we, well, ostensibly, you can be really critical and say it's not true, but um, you can be realistically our votes and how we get people into power, they then have to represent what they think the public wants to hear. So if we as the public are asking for, you know, more action to be done on human trafficking because we read a recent campaign that says that it's everywhere. Well, then your politicians are going to go forward on that basis. I mean, I, I'm sure everyone here has taken part in several different political uh, task forces and everything else where we've given the data, we've given the knowledge, you know, we, I mean, you can talk to sex workers who've been doing this advocacy work for generations, who will say they have been collecting the data and they have been presenting empirical studies to the people in power for so long and yet it doesn't get listened to. And the reason it doesn't get, well, one of the reasons it doesn't get listened to is of course because of this politicization piece and because your politicians are only going to do what's going to keep you getting elected. Right, so when we're dealing with that kind of a situation, why does labor trafficking get completely ignored because sex trafficking takes up all of our space because it does all these functional things, but also because it's actually what we're asking for. We as a society are not at the point where we're willing to extend labor rights the way that we ought to be doing so. We know we're not even willing to give civic inclusion, as Chris Bruckert says, uh, to sex workers who you know, are, are a part of every one of our communities. So the idea of extending that to, you know, anything beyond that is, is, is just totally beyond what people are willing to do. So, sorry, that was a bit longer than needed. No, thank you. It's actually a great segue um, to the next question that I wanted to raise. And it was about um, the information that the general public and others, policymakers, lawmakers, uh, NGOs are receiving um, about human trafficking, but specifically, speaking about the media, can you um, comment or speak on the accuracy of the information that the general public receives about um, human trafficking? Kamala? I think we're all laughing because- <laughs> We're I just mean, the media. <laughs> <this> question. <laughs> <laughs> the media is, is it's just picking up, you know, a very superficial um, um, items that they can sell, you know, and profit from. Um, and, um, you know, this is, again, one of those quick and easy fixes, I think, again, you know, it's, uh, it's about moral issues, it's about sexual issues. Um, and, um, you know, I there's there's not enough media that's critical i think of this discourse so we are fed and it re just reproduces this discourse of um that we've been talking about that you know harms more than it helps that's all i'll say i think on that matter annalee I mean, I think that one of the area, I mean, it's not just journalism, but we just have to look at the spate of law and order episodes, Hollywood films that use anti-trafficking or trafficking as a trope in order to create a particular narrative. And I think that those areas of the media are very, very powerful in terms of shaping understandings of trafficking. So for example, when I, teach my course on sex work and trafficking, I ask students at the outset, do you know what trafficking is? And then most times there will be reference to some sort of media discussion, whether it's a Hollywood film or an episode of a crime show where uh, 
you know, um, an episode or a situation of trafficking is is uh, profiled, and that's a very very powerful mechanism in order to produce that produces the discourse. And that's all I have to say on that one either. And I think that the use of sensationalism and really tweaking into the emotional into the emotional aspect of I think that most of us do not want to see people harmed and exploited, but the way in which it's framed, there is a particular narrative that is always presented. And, and oftentimes with the use of really gratuitous violence as in order to make the point. Yeah, I, I agree, uh, Annalie. I'll just uh, speak from my own experience over the years of working with policymakers in government and uh, police officers in decision-making roles and uh, when asked why they were working or what drew them to this cause, there have been responses that um, I, I saw a Hollywood movie and that's what brought me to this and what has informed that and uh, it's just so very heartening, disheartening uh, to hear that. Um, Joel or Tamara? Yes, Tamara. I was just gonna just gonna bring up the fact that of what we've mentioned a few times too about how easy some messaging is, but the the opposite of that is how not easy, <laughs> how complicated um, some other messages. I know that a lot of us who've been working with different um, community-based organizations for years have really struggled to get our messages um, out to the public because our message isn't a one simple issue. Our message is usually something around, please stop thinking things are so easily fixed, um, unless your whole thing is take down capitalism. Um, really, there's, there's not like a, a silver bullet kind of an answer for any of the issues. And so trying to package messages messaging and get people to understand the global dynamics at play here, the, the underlying major economic and, and um, organized society kind of issues that are affecting what's going on on the, that's big, it kind of like people's minds just think it would glaze over, you know, and I think as Annalise said, when you have those, those classes, you get for 13 weeks, you get three hours a week and all your readings and, you know, like there's a really rare audience that we have where we can actually, by the end, they're going to nod in their heads, you know, okay, yeah, I get it. But most people are not in a position where they're willing to engage in that level of knowledge building and understanding. So I think that's another really key piece. And I know that a lot of, a lot of sex workers who've been working so hard on these issues for so long have struggled is in terms of getting their messages heard and received by different audiences. Joel. At the risk of being a little contrarian, I, I just want to suggest that, that the media is a relatively easy focal point for this kind of conversation because they're the most visible kind of representation. And, and I don't mean to kind of disagree with, with anything that's been said to date, but I, I think there's a cross fertilization and intersection between the media and other actors that you can miss if you just attribute sole responsibility to the media. So the, 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 the US State Department tip reports create forms of authoritative knowledge which then become the basis for media reports. The, the ILO puts out a, a definite, a, an estimate of, of 40.3 million slaves in the world. Um, it's rubbish, but it nonetheless comes from the ILO, which is affiliated to the United Nations, and consequently it gets picked up. And all of a sudden you have a kind of wall of different sources of information that are all cross-referencing each other in ways that means this thing becomes and appears far more authoritative than I think it would if you were just focusing on what specific journalists are doing. So, so I, there's, there's multiple layers to this and I think it's easy to go to the media because the media is most visible, but the media is interacting with these other layers. I'd also say, and, and I'm aware at this point in the conversation, we're potentially coming across as overly pessimistic <laughs> regarding this thing and where we might go. I do think there are pockets where the, the things are changing and ways of speaking and acting look differently to the way they're described. And, and I'd like to think that, that this video and the project associated with it is one of those things as part of a larger effort. So, so 
notwithstanding the scale of the things that, that we're all grappling with, I do think having worked on, on these types of issues for a while, that, that there are changes going on. They're just going on below the surface in ways that aren't necessarily easily evident at the, the highest levels. And we all focus on the highest levels because they have the greatest center of gravity in terms of how the rest of us think and act on this issue. So I do think there are changes. They're just hard to latch onto and they're not necessarily uniform. They're concentrated in particular sectors and, and areas and issues. So uh, it's not all the media's fault <laughs> and there's stuff going on below the surface, which I do think is promising. Yeah, that's a good segue. I'd like to leave uh, a little bit of time for some uh, some of the fantastic questions that are being posed by the audience. Um, but that's a really important point to make uh, about the media. It's just not the media. Um, so when thinking about concrete things that people can do to engage in this issue differently, um, one of the things that we suggest is checking the sources of information. However, you just brought up, Joel, some of those sources are part of the problem. You discussed the US trafficking in persons report. So can anyone speak on the problem with trying to find evidence-based information about human trafficking when some of the sources putting it out are the governments and uh, who are just complicit in, in disseminating the, the misinformation? Yes, um, Yeah, I think sort of trying to track sources is a hard one and, you know, to trying to find the truth and the real trafficking and to try to separate, you know, and to capture the real cases of trafficking against those that are not and to sort all of that out. Um, I do feel very strongly that, um, and I'm sure this is, I mean, this is not my idea at all, but I'm just echoing many others here as well, is that, you know, the organizations, labor rights organizations, migrant rights organizations, sex worker rights organizations, are doing work to end a lot of violence and, and exploitation um, um, on the ground and not, not just on the ground, policy-wise as well. Um, and it's their work and they don't always necessarily engage with a discourse on anti-trafficking or trafficking, but it's those organizations that actually we should be supporting the most, I think, as an alternative and not necessarily putting all our eggs into the human trafficking basket and and really looking to the work that's being done by labor rights organizations by you know migrants rights organizations and so giving our support to that in whatever way we can and you know what they and and, and finding out what their needs are and how best to support those um, movements and struggles and policy work and media representation coming out from that work as well Yes, Emily. I, uh, I totally agree. And I think that the one of the findings of sex workers organizing for change is that the sex workers that were interviewed, as well as the organizations, they argue that, you know, sex workers and sex worker organizations are less interested in labels, you know, whether they're trafficked, smuggled, whatever whatever we're going to apply, the many labels, but they were really more interested in addressing the concrete circumstances of workers in a particular sector. And it doesn't, the label is less important than being able to provide peer-based support to, to workers in a particular sector. So I would totally agree that the supporting of organizations that work with migrant workers directly, sex workers directly, domestic workers directly. I think those are the places that we should go for the information because they actually know what is happening on the ground as opposed to the ILO, as opposed to the government of Canada or local police services. Thank you for that. Um, 
I think a question that I know that keeps coming up in my work, even after people hear a conversation such as this, is just how prevalent is trafficking? And, and you know, we talked, we started out the beginning just talking about the definitional challenges of actually what is being measured anyway. Um, Tamara, I'm wondering if you would be able to speak um, to the limitations of statistics generally. And I know you did a study recently where you did a legal analysis of uh, human trafficking um, prosecutions or cases in Canada. Yeah, um, Dr. Haley Miller is the primary researcher on that piece, um, and she's in our audience today as well. Um, but uh, that piece it was was a really fascinating project to do because the only reason we did that project, I think, is part of what what um, Kamala you started talking about at the outset of this too. I know Allison, we've spoken about this before, but it's because human trafficking kind of arrived in our laps. Right? I think a lot of us were doing work relating to victimization, anti-violence work, and then kind of this global thing appeared and Canada said, ooh, we better get on this or else we're going to get our hands slapped by the US. And so people like me were asked to speak as experts about human trafficking. Not an expert about human, certainly wasn't at all an expert on human trafficking. I had done work with sex workers, um, which to me was a very, a very different group because nobody I'd ever spoken to said, I am a victim of human trafficking. Uh, so what we did is we decided, okay, well, let's go find out a little bit more about this thing because we're being asked to speak on it all the time. And so we started peeling back the layers of how do you even do research and data collection in this area. And that was the first challenge is how difficult it is to access information that is reliable because our court systems do not reproduce it in reliable ways. Uh, provincially, we have different, or like some people's countries might be state versus federal, um, but there's distinctions between how people report even locally, not even nationally, right? And then um, some things are reported as convictions, whereas other things are reported as, as charges. And charges are very different from convictions and for all sorts of reasons you know we teach in our basic criminology classes about the the funnel the dark the funnel of crime you know that things end up huge up here by the time it actually gets through the court process you're dealing with a small segment so what is better to report is it the possible charges that exist out there or is it the ones who actually get convictions because there's all sorts of reasons particularly around like violence issues for why they don't actually get convictions because our colonial legal system is brutal in terms of how people experience those. So particularly if you are a black or indigenous or other person of color, your likelihood of receiving success or justice under the Canadian colonial system is pretty, pretty dismal. But having said all that, we do have to rely on something to count. So this is where there's always been all these, these, these discussions around what's the best way to count. So what Haley and I did is we counted convictions. And what we found is there's actually, we found 92 convictions across about a 10 year period, uh, which is not high. And when you actually looked at what these convictions were, there actually wasn't even one successful conviction of an international human trafficking situation. So this was all policing of domestic, what we used to call maybe some kind of um, um, uh, living on the veils, material benefits, uh, pimping colloquially. Uh, those were the kinds of things that are now falling under what human trafficking uh, was initially designed to be. So you can actually see in the charts the, the downward trend, right, with the ch change in criminalization in Canada uh, for the amount of prosecutions that have happened under prostitution related offenses and the upward trend in human trafficking as the human trafficking literally replaces the other ones. So the numbers are small. What does that tell us though? I, that's where you, you lose your confidence, right? Because they, they just tell us what's gone through the court system. And again, like, they, they, yes, we found 92 cases. There could be more uh, because not all, it's not as easy to find these cases as, as one might believe. Um, but our numbers are very different from what the government was producing because, of course, as I mentioned before, they were actually relying on charges. And then when they did rely on convictions, it was including convictions of that trafficking related category, which included anything under the sun. It is really a gross misrepresentation of the actual convictions of human trafficking. Thank you for that. And perhaps the last question, oh, sorry, Joel, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say on, on the questions of prevalence, there's, there's two things that are always said. Because human trafficking is a concealed and covert criminal enterprise, we can't possibly know how big it is. At the same time, we're very, very confident that it's increasing rapidly. Both of these things cannot be true simultaneously. And at the same time, they get repeated over and over again 
in such a way that they, they kind of convey a level of urgency. So, so in lots of ways, questions of prevalence and, and claims about statistics uh, need to be understood as advocacy tools, as, as ways of kind of connecting to public audiences and demonstrating kind of increasing and dramatically large scale and scope. Um, and, and they're resistant to challenge, partly because if you do challenge them, you'll be asked to come up with a better number. And, and secondly, if you do come up with a number and, and good empirical research has come up with numbers, not global numbers, because you can't have global numbers, but local numbers, those local numbers will get ignored because they don't fit the narrative. So uh, a lot of these claims are, are very strongly fact resistant because the agendas behind them are tied to the idea that this must be massive and it must be accelerated. Yeah, thank you. That, that, those are really, really um, important points. Um, the last question that I'd like to ask you before we get to some of the questions um, that have come in from the viewers is, um, so if we're suggesting that some campaigns are ineffective and others are harmful, so how can people engage differently on this issue? Uh, that could be someone of the, just from the general public, uh, it could be a policymaker, it could be police, it could be the media, you can choose any or all of those. So what are some concrete things that people can do to engage differently on this, um, on this issue? Again, a big question for the very end. I, I just want to jump in here and say one of them, um, when I'm faced with a question of, or a statement that somebody will make at a talk or something that, you know, I know somebody who's been trafficked, um, it's real, right? Um, my first question is, well, what is the actual situation? What are we? Do, what are we looking at? What is the? What is the case? Is it a situation that a woman was forced into sex work? Is it that she was helped across a border, right, um, and um, smuggled into a country? Was it that she's or or he has been, you know, underpaid or poorly paid or you know forced to work, work long hours? I think the actual First of all, we've got to think about what is the situation that's being described? What are the actual nitty gritties? I mean, rather than just calling it trafficking, what is meant by that? I think we should ask ourselves that, first of all, and then begin to think about, okay, well, who might be addressing this issue? And perhaps we can you know, go to them and find out how we can then work further on it. I think it's really important it's, it, because we tend to you know, people tend to think, oh yeah, that's trafficked and we all know what it means then. But I, I think the first thing to do is to really stop, stand still and just think, well, what is the situation here that we are trying to address? And look at it carefully. So, yeah. Emily? I would totally agree with that point. And I think that just to reiterate what came out of the sex workers organizing for change, and this could apply to other labor sectors, is that the label itself is less important oftentimes than the actual circumstances and how to address those circumstances. And um, certainly in the attempts to achieve justice, perhaps, the label might be important because it would fall under a particular criminal code legislation. But in the everyday lives, at least this is what we heard, the everyday lives of sex workers and sex worker organizations is that the label itself is less important than the actual circumstances that needed to be addressed. And that could apply also to domestic workers, agricultural workers, factory workers, et cetera, et cetera. What is the situation that, um, that needs to be addressed and how to best devise strategies in order to do so? Anyone else on that question about concrete actions? Yes, 
Um, I would just say that I think in terms of if we are asking for something, um, students, I think, can do a lot of work in this area by learning critical skills uh, for reading sources, but also learning to question everything and learning how stats are used uh, on, on a regular basis. Um, that, that one's, I think, you know, that's what students should be doing uh, in my mind and in my classes. Um, but I think that the general public should also, you know, I, I, I know I've, I, maybe this is a big ask, um, but to start recognizing how limited their sources are and that a news article is not necessarily going to give them the whole picture on something. Um, I think from media, we should be asking for better distinctions between opinion and fact, or at least some acknowledgement that these are opinion statements rather than factual statements. And I think that from media, we should also be asking for more caveats to be published about things like whether this is a politicized statement or whether this is backed up in any capacity by any any empirical source whatsoever. Um, but I also think that we can require or ask of our media for follow-ups. I mean, how often do we receive these, well, hundreds of men have been captured in an online sting, you know, and then we hear nothing about what actually happens out of this. And later on, like two years later from doing investigation, you find out that there wasn't a single charge that came out of that. But at the time, everybody patted themselves on the back for doing their action project for that week. So I think uh, those follow-up pieces are really necessary uh, from our media, but I think we should also be asking from our politicians from some more accuracy and some accountability for the statements that they're making, particularly as things become the law. I think we should be requiring our law have at least some kind of a foundation for it. Uh, the fact that it can be as ideological and politicized as it currently is, is quite remarkable to me. Um, and I think that we need to also really ask for the government to be accountable in terms of things like publishing statistics, um, racialized data. It's, it's amazing to me that we have been invisibilizing how we are actually applying the law for as long as we have in Canada. And yet that is the situation that we have here. We simply don't have the data to support the fact that there is incredible systemic racism that goes on in our, in our justice system. So we need to be transparent and accountable in terms of how we are delivering our colonial law here. And Joel, just, uh, yes, yeah, the last word on this. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I think, firstly, and, and this is kind of inherent in, in the title of the project, I, I think the impulse to help to do something is actually worth reflecting and sometimes resisting. I, I think the bottom line on this has to be do no harm. And, and if there is no confidence that the, the thing that you're contemplating will not meet that threshold, it's actually that the ethical and personal choice to not do it may actually be better. I think like there's this premium on activity. All activities must be beneficial in some way, however small. And, and I'm not sure that necessarily works. So, so I think that do no harm injunction, it's never emotionally a satisfying injunction, but I still think it's worth reiterating here. And then secondly, Anti-trafficking is a terrible platform for political mobilization. It's inherently conservative. It doesn't let you grapple with the effects of systems. So in lots of ways, I, I think moving off anti-trafficking is a focal point for organization and instead thinking about migration and labor and gender and race and the intersections between them is a far more effective way of positioning yourself if you actually want to change. And I wanna suggest here that anti-trafficking is popular because it doesn't cha challenge dominant political and economic interests. I think a good test of whether activism is actually having an effect is when those dominant political and economic interests start getting worried that things have gone too far, that, that anti-trafficking has overstepped its bounds, that, that migrant rights are, are threatening the economy, um, and so on and so forth, because then you actually have a political disagreement where interests are lined up over something that is actually at stake. And, and one of the problems with anti-trafficking is that it's comfortable because it's not speaking back to power, 
And unless and until it actually speaks back to power, it's just displacing activity that could be more productively spent on other issues and thinking in other ways. Thank you. So we have a few minutes left and I'd like to get to some of the questions that have come in. Um, so one of the questions is, uh, I'm wondering if any of the panelists can comment on the role of survivors and survivor stories in all of this, the fine lines between their truths and the importance of their truths being shared and the intersections of those truths with the harms and collateral damage that comes from mainstream anti-trafficking campaigns. Yes. I'll just say something quickly. Um, as I understand it, the very I, notion of collateral damage and um, harm from anti-trafficking, it actually comes from people who have been um, exploited in some way, harmed in some way, um, have been caught up in what we call trafficking. Um, if you want those survivors who've come through. So I, I understand that what we're talking about, that, that kind of pushback against the dominant mainstream anti-trafficking um, discourse comes precisely from those people who have experience in it. We as, we're as we academics and we are listening to them and taking those voices and putting it into something else. But the actual um, critique of anti-trafficking discourse comes from those people who have experienced both the harms of exploitation, as well as the harms of anti-trafficking discourse. Thank you. Um, another question, um, isn't sex trafficking a type of labor trafficking and why does the rhetoric imply they are separate? I just, I will just say, I saw, I just saw that there and we have Carol Lee in our audience, which I would just like to say hello and thank you for being you. Um, but um, yeah, you know what, we fell into that trap, didn't we? Um, it, you're right. It's, it's a way to call us out on that. It, that. We are really trying to say that sex trafficking, you know, that sex workers are different from sex trafficking, that there's it's a labor issue. And I think that's a piece of what Annalie and Kamala were both um, bringing up too around the resistance to labels, right? I mean, the label is handy in terms of making it all like labor exploitation but then when we start to distinguish between experiences and you know the trying to present it all as one is another big trap and I think this is maybe it speaks back also to um, this issue of where, what do we do with with survivor voices and you know what is their role um, trying to present this as if it is a monolithic one uh, experience is, is totally misrepresentative and I think that we need to always remember the breadth and the great diversity of experiences for any of these issues um, but uh, yes, thank you, Carol, for the reminder about, about our labels and our own wrongful use. We continue to learn from you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to that uh, incredibly important question? I think that the distinction is a historical one. I think that it emerged at the very moment when when this most recent iteration of anti-trafficking emerged and the discussions around it but um i would argue that if sex work is labor that um if we're looking at various forms of exploitation i guess the argument that i was making is that somehow um if you conflate sex work and trafficking then the assumption is that all, and it's usually cisgendered women, they, there's very little discussion of, you know, trans sex workers or men who engage in the sex industry, that if you operate from the premise that this, you know, that all women in the sex industry are trafficked, then that also affects statistics, but it also creates the ways in which the understanding of trafficking in the sex industry is is separated from the more mundane exploitation of workers in other industries which we seem to under a neoliberal capitalist system seem to accept as acceptable so the distinction i think has always been there in the 
most recent iteration of anti-trafficking. And I realized that even in the TIP report at a certain point, I think it was 2010 or 2008, the, the US State Department suddenly discovered labor trafficking. But you know, the, the, the dichotomy between the two has never been significantly challenged. Thank you. I, I just, I, oh, sorry, Joel, go ahead. Um, I just want to kind of remind us that um, the sort of the big UN protocols and conventions from the 1940s, but the early um, 20th century um, around white slavery were all about prostitution and um, trafficking and prostitution were, uh, you know, synonymous. And it's only under the, the 2000 protocol that there became some kind of separation between the two and trafficking became defined as something broader. And I think we can't, and we've never, that's never been really um, addressed or that root of this idea of trafficking has never been really undone. Mm -hmm. or challenge. So it's, it's, it, the conflation is it's very tight and historically it's very strong. Mm -hmm. okay. And Joel? I just, I mean, I, I, I think to, to Mara's point is right, like we, we didn't get it right and we need to kind of change the language. I, I think just to follow on with that, um, I, I think this, this like binary between sex trafficking and labor trafficking also comes with an additional ancillary problem in that it, it kind of tends to diminish the gender dimensions of labor trafficking and the, the, the types of kind of sexual violence and harassment that are kind of typically characteristic of situations of exploitation uh, in outside commercial sex. So, so example on in kind of domestic labor for example, that gets flagged as labor trafficking, but in lots of ways, its characteristic feature is forms of vulnerability that pave the way for gender-based violence and harm. And, and so this, this kind of binary comes with all kinds of complications, but there's this risk that we end up reproducing it by taking on the language of the things that we seek to critique. And, and it's very hard to fully get away from that, but we really should be continuing to endeavor to do so. Mm -hmm. I agree. I'm mindful of the time. And um, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, these are very complex issues. And I, and I wish we had more time for our panelists. Um, I just want to just note in the chat box, um, the resources that we have um, mentioned today are there including um, Swan's resources, one there from uh, Dr. O'Doherty and also one there from Dr. Quirk. I'm just wondering, Joel, if you could just briefly in maybe 30 seconds or so, just talk about that course that you have, because if people are interested in in just exploring what um, more effective work could look like here. Uh, I think that course that you have covers that. Okay, so um, some colleagues and I worked together on a project called Beyond Trafficking and Slavery that, that I'd imagine that, that at least some of you have heard of previously. We compiled a bunch of our articles and kind of put together people on the, the, the team to create a, a massive online open course called Forced and Precarious Labor in the Global Economy. Um, and it's designed to think about different forms of labor and the relationship between labor and migration and to, to think about what solutions look like in contexts where your goal should be to challenge systems rather than focus upon individual cases. So I'm assuming the link is, is, is somewhere I can't see, but I, it, it, the course is currently uh, running off an old version, um, but you can still register and access all the content. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you so much to our uh, panelists uh, for sharing your insights today. And um, 
thank you to all of those who uh, tuned in to listen to our dialogue about this today. So thank you. <laughs>